I read uh, this last week that the Alaska Department of Fish and Game ha has uh, issued a declaration that all reindeer, both male and female, produce antlers. A in fact, uh, they said that the males will lose their antlers somewhere around November, the very beginning of winter, but the females keep their antlers all the way through the spring until they have uh, their babies. And, and so if that fact is true, which I believe that it is, and, and all of the depictions that we have of the reindeers hauling Santa uh, you know, through the sky, it means that all of the reindeers were female uh, reindeers. Right? Hallelujah. Right? In fact, none of us are surprised by that. Only a woman could haul a fat guy around the whole planet without stopping and asking for directions and not getting lost all in one night. Now tonight, or today rather, as we move forward in this series, I want to tell you one of the things that I love to do when I first take a group off of an airplane and onto the soil of Israel and that very first day, uh, when, when we drive all the way up to uh, the Sea of Galilee and, and overlooking the Sea of Galilee, I will say to the, to the crowd, hey, I want you to get an image in your mind. I want you to get a word. Who is God? Who is God to you and, and, and what is God? And, and I just want you to think through that. In fact, I want you to play along with me this morning. Who is God and what do you think of when, when you think of God? Get a sentence, get a word, get a thought in, in your mind. And, and if you're in America, which all of you are, that then, uh, which by the way, if you're watching all over the world, we're so glad that you're watching all over the world. In fact, we're blown away that you're watching all over the world. Would you just welcome those who are watching all over the world? And, and, and uh, in fact, let me just say uh, to those of you who are watching and, and other places that our theological conviction around here is, is that we hope you enjoy this. We hope that this will supplement your walk with Christ and come alongside you and, and will supplement your relationship with a local church. That church is not just content. Church is relationships. Church is people. Church is discipleship. And, and so we hope this content will further your walk with Christ as you plug into a local church. But, but if you're watching somewhere else in the world, you're your answer may be different than those of us who think with a Western mindset. If you're here in America and you think with a Western mindset, uh, your mind probably, and it always happens in Israel, goes to words like omnipotent or omnipresent or love or, or holy. But, but if you were to ask an Eastern or Middle Easterner or someone from Israel, I promise you, you're going to get a different answer to that question of who is God. Because Middle Easterners and, and Eastern people and Jewish people, they think of God and quite honestly, really everything in terms of picture. They, they think in pictures, and, and they put a picture in their mind. That's how they operate. I want you to look at what Mark told us to do in chapter 4, uh, in verse 24. He said, consider what you hear. Now, that's the Greek translation uh, of that verse, but the Hebrew is written this way. Look at what you hear. Look at what you hear. Now, how on earth would you do that? How do you look at what you hear? The answer is in picture. That's how you do that. But the problem with Western thinking is, how do you picture omnipotent? And what picture would you go to for holiness? What does that picture even look like? Because when a Jew thinks of God, they think in terms of shepherd, they think in terms of rock or dad or, or nursing mother or light. They have a picture in their mind. And by the way, it's always my. They always put the personal pronoun my in front of it. it he, he's my shepherd. He's my rock. He's my dad. He's my light. And, and that one, my light, that's where I want to dive in today and, and, and focus into that one because all month long, we've been taking a deeper look at the holidays. And we've been using the Jewish holidays outlined and prescribed by God in the Old Testament as our guide to understand the Christ uh, of Christmas. Because as we look back to what God uh, prophesied and promised in the Old Testament that was fulfilled in the New Testament, and we look forward to what it is that God is even planning now, by looking at the Jewish holidays, we get a glimpse of all of that. And some of you have been kind enough to point out to us that we haven't covered all of the Jewish holidays. And uh, you look at your little app on your phone and iCal or your Jewish app or whatever, and these, these holidays pop up on your calendar like Yom Kippur. And I just want to say to you, we covered that one. 
okay? You weren't paying attention. I covered that one, did a very good job with that one. That is another name for the Day of Atonement, okay? So we, we covered that one. But there are other holidays in your app that we didn't cover, and you're right about that. And that's because, yes, they are Jewish holidays, but they happened after the Old Testament was written. And so they're not listed in the Old Testament. A couple of examples. One of them is Purim. Purim, what's that? that? That's a celebration of the story of Esther, which is a little weird in our mind, but they, 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 they like children in Halloween in America dress up. The Israelite children will dress up at Purim, and, and I'm not exactly sure why, but they do. And, and then they will read the story of Esther, and they will cheer uh, for Esther, and they will boo! Haman, the guy who tried to kill all the Jews, and they will act this whole story out. But, but another one uh, that's been mentioned, and I'm going to cover it today, probably the most popular of all Jewish holidays, is the holiday called Hanukkah. And, and maybe in your app it has a C in, in front of it, and, and it's not Chanukah, but, but it's the exact same uh, holiday. And, and if you were a product of the 80s, like I'm a product of the 80s, the very first thing you think when you hear the word Hanukkah is Adam Sandler on, on Saturday Night Live, right? Doing the songs, a turkey for me and a turkey for you, right? But he did one uh, about Hanukkah. Put on your Hanukkah to celebrate. Han no, yarmulke. Put on your yarmulke to celebrate Hanukkah. It's so much fanica to celebrate. He did an awesome job, right? <laughs> and, and, and so it always happens at this time of year. It always happens right at Christmas in December. And, and how many nights is Hanukkah? Eight nights. A couple of you got it right. Eight nights. You know why it's eight nights. So here, here's the reason. And by the way, it's not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. And the reason is, is because it celebrates something that happened right in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament, if you remember, ends with the Jews coming back from exile, back into the promised land. But they were not the governing party. They were not the ruling party. The Persians were ruling at that time. And, and sometime Somewhere around the close of the Old Testament, the Greeks took over and whipped the Persians, right? This is why world history is so important. Remember the name Alexander the Great. He defeats the Persians. He's one of the greatest warriors or, or, or war minds of all time. But hear me, he's not just a warrior. He was a missionary, and he was out to change the world. And he knew that if he could get people to look inside to themselves as the center of the universe, that they would leave their God. And so they all need a theme theater, right? And, and for entertainment. And they all need a stadium for this bombaric, you know, and they all need a bath where they can get naked in front of everybody else. And they all, and so he was, he was trying to change the world and he almost did it by the way. He almost did it. He defeated the Persians, and for a couple of hundred years, the land of Israel was ruled by the Greeks. Under the Persians, the Jews could worship any way they wanted to. But under the Greeks, they were not allowed to. In fact, the Greeks took over the temple and erected an altar to Zeus right in the middle of the Holy of Holies. And the Greeks would not let them celebrate uh, the, the major feast or any of the major Sabbaths. And so somewhere around 164 B.C., a group of Jews got sick of it. Anybody know the name of these Jews? Who said that? Very good. You went to vacation Bible school, didn't you? The Maccabees, right? The Maccabees are the ones who did that. And so the Maccabees came in, and, and they, 6,000 of them, marched directly into Jerusalem, marched right into the temple, and took on the Greeks. 50,000 soldiers taken on by 6,000 Jews, and they won. And then they marched right, right into the temple and they tore down the altar of Zeus and, and they started cleaning out the altar, the pagan idols and all of it. And they lit the candlestick, the temple candlestick, which a new one was created called a menorah for us to celebrate what happened during that moment. So why eight candles? By the way, this is where we get the, the word lit. He's so lit or that was lit right out of Hanukkah. And, and the only problem was there was only enough oil, olive oil, for one night to burn the candle for one night. You had, had to use very special olive oil and it had to be made properly and it had to be consecrated uh, to be used in the menorah and it would take eight days for them to make this and consecrate it and, and so they prayed and God answered. 
and the candlestick stayed lit for eight days on one day's worth of oil. And if you've ever been told that God was silent and did nothing for his people in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have been lied to. This is one example of many examples where God was acting on behalf of his people. So you fast forward from that moment nearly 200 years to Jesus walking on this planet. And here's the question that comes around often when you study this kind of material. Did Jesus celebrate Hanukkah? And the answer is absolutely he celebrated Hanukkah. He was a good Jewish boy. In, in fact, you need to hear me when I say to you, Jesus was not a Christian. Put that in your Western hat. He was not a Christian. Of course, Christianity comes from and out of Jesus, but he wasn't a Christian. He was a Jewish rabbi. And so, of course, he celebrated Hanukkah. Where do you find that in the Bible? John chapter 10. Turn in your Bible there to John chapter 10. And I want to show you in verse 22, it says it was now winter and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah or the Feast of Dedication. Some of you are reading your Bible and you're saying, Pastor, my Bible does not say Hanukkah. I've never seen Hanukkah in there. It says the Feast of Dedication. Same thing. That's what Hanukkah means, okay? Hanukkah means dedication. It's called the Feast of Dedication, or it's called Hanukkah in Hebrew. And why would it be called the Feast of Dedication? Because that's what they did. They dedicated the temple back to God. They removed all the altars and all the idols and dedicated it back to the Lord. Look at the next verse. Jesus was in the temple walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. So he's in the temple at this time during Hanukkah. And they, during Hanukkah, they had lights everywhere. They lit candles everywhere, not just candles, torches. And they had huge candles and huge lights and everything is lit up like a big Christmas tree. And that's the picture and that's the scene. And Jesus is walking around looking at all of these candles and lights. And because he's Jesus, he is recognized. Now watch how this plays out. Verse 24, the people surrounded him and asked him, how long are you going to keep us in suspense, Jesus? If you are the Messiah, tell us, tell us plainly. And Jesus said, hey, I have already told you and you don't believe me. Now I want to push pause or time out just for a second. And I want you to think through this. There are lights everywhere. It's Hanukkah. A couple of chapters before in chapter eight, I think somewhere around verse 12 and in the chapter in between chapter nine, somewhere around verse five, Jesus declares out of his mouth, I am the light of the world. And so there is very much a connection here. Jesus is the light of the world. We said last week he was most likely conceived during the Festival of Lights, during this festival we're talking about today, during Hanukkah. By the way, when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, that's one of seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus said, I am. And, he, and he filled in the blank, seven different phrases that he used about himself. By the way, it's a reference all the way back to Moses where God said to Moses, when Moses said, who shall I tell Pharaoh sent me? He said, I am. And so every time Jesus said, I am, it was a reference back to those Greek words or those Hebrew words, ego and me, I am. I am who I am. I am what you need. I am who I say I am. And so seven times Jesus let us know who he was with these seven I am statements. And, and we're going to do a series in next spring out of these seven I am. So we're going to walk through them one at a time. It's going to be awesome. I'm, all, I'm already studying it. It's going to be good. We're going to do a series at the beginning of the year in January called Anointed. And what does it mean to walk in the anointing of God? And then we're going to spend four or five weeks in a book of the Bible in the Old Testament called the Song of Solomon, which is a, a marriage book and a, and a, a biblical relationships book. And, and then we're going to do the seven I am's and we will conclude that series on Easter Sunday with I am the resurrection and, and the life. And it's going to be amazing. In fact, people ask me all the time, what's your favorite sermon? And, and as a pastor, my answer is always, whatever's next. It's whatever's next. In fact, right now, these are my favorite sermons. But, but in a few weeks, anointed will be my favorite sermons but because it's what I'm in and what God's doing and, and where we're going. But, but I want to go back to this conversation Jesus is having during Hanukkah. And they wanted to know when Jesus would shoot straight with them and when Jesus would give them a straight answer. Are you the Messiah or not, Jesus? Yes or no? And Jesus says, open your eyes. I have been telling you. And by the way, there's no problem with the proof. They had a problem with their sight. 
Now let me just sidebar for a second and, and teach you a little Jewish uh, education system here. There's a Jewish teaching mentality or philosophy called remez. If you want to Google that later, you can look it up. R-E-M-E-Z. Remez, I think that's how you spell it. Not positive, not a good spelling. Remez is uh, the philosophy that there are multiple meanings to the text. There's an obvious meaning and a a more hidden meaning, but is this more deeper or the more significant meaning? Now, typically the way this would work is in Jewish culture, you always answered a question with a question. I don't know if you noticed that, but Jesus does that all the time. They they will say, uh, where did you get your authority? Well, where did John get his? And there's always answering. But by the way, the answer is in the question that is asked back. They go question, 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 but they're not just playing a game. They are actually answering each other's questions. And and so uh, when when they asked them that question, he would answer back, and the answer to the question was in the question that he asked back. You understand what I'm saying? And in fact, in Remez, it it means that when a verse of Scripture was quoted from the Bible, that, that it was not just that verse that he was answering with, but the verse either before or the verse after, which meant what? It meant you had to know the text. Which, by the way, in that culture, all of them knew the text. They had it memorized, right? And, and so Jesus clearly knew the text. And I just want to say to you, if you want to be a follower of the Jewish rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, you've got to have a relationship with the text. You've got to know the text. You've got to know it in your heart. You've got to hide it in your heart. You have to know the Bible so that you can understand the context of what is going on here. And so in this phrase, I'll give you an example of Remez, okay? Do you remember in uh, the Gospels, Jesus? is coming into Jerusalem and all of the children are saying Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest and and, and they're worshiping him and the religious leaders see this and they say, you tell those children to shut up. Now what does Jesus do there? He quotes scripture. Psalm chapter eight, verse two, he says, out of the mouth of babes have I ordained praise. And the very next verse says, and they wanted to kill him. Now, why on earth would they want to kill somebody who said, out of the mouth of babes, I I have ordained worship? It's the next phrase that Jesus was alluding to. And the next phrase in Psalm chapter 8, verse 2 is, I have ordained praise out of the mouth of children on account of my adversaries and to silence my enemies. And they wanted to kill him. And Jesus was pointing to it. And as smart as these people were, they knew all of this. And as smart as they were, they could not see what was right in front of them. And their problem, this was the problem from the very beginning, that God would send his truth, the light, and his people were blind to the light. So go back to the beginning of John, the gospel of John. Okay, let's back up 10 chapters to the very beginning of John, to his Christmas story. Now the Christmas story The traditional one, the one we read every year at Christmas, is found only in Luke and in Matthew. You know that, right? Because Mark, he jumps right into the action about Jesus' life. But but John goes back, 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 just a lot of backs, right? He goes all the way back to the beginning. He goes all the way back to creation. In fact, he's alluding to creation when he says, in the beginning. Now, Matthew and Luke tell us what happened during the Christmas story, John tells us the meaning behind what happened. Okay, so let's go look at it. In John uh, chapter one, and, and let's read it together. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, or with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. He's going back to Genesis 1.1. You see the illusion there? In the beginning, God. And now what John is saying is in the beginning, the word was God, was with God, and already existed. You get down to verse 14, and he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I told you last week that word dwelt means Sukkot, or tabernacled among us. If you weren't here the last two weeks, go back. These are my favorite messages right now. The last two that I just did. Go back and listen to these messages. You need to understand the background and the context. But last week we unpacked how that works, that he tabernacled among us and what it means for Jesus to say, God is with us. It's a big, big deal. Now look at verse uh, three. God created everything through him. That's Jesus, the word. Everything through him and nothing was created except through Jesus, the word Jesus gave life to everything that was created and his life, look at it, brought light 
to everyone. And, and so from the very start, John is using the image of light. And light shows up over and over and over again throughout the Gospel of John. And if you read it, you will see light, 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 light all the time. And then you get here to chapter 10. It's the festival of lights, it's Hanukkah, and if you read this through a Western lens, you miss it. You miss the illusion altogether. But, but you read it through an Eastern uh, lens, you see it, and you, you're tracking right along with the writer, the gospel writer, because you know this is Hanukkah, and Hanukkah is the festival of lights. And so you're reading about Jesus being the light of the world, and you get to Hanukkah, and it's all spelled out for you. So what is it about light that's so important to Jesus and who Jesus is? How is light a sign to the Messiahship of Jesus? Well, one of the most quoted scriptures in all of the Bible during Christmas is found in Isaiah chapter 9. You've heard it before. The prophet Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, sat down and he penned these words related to the birth of the Messiah. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest upon his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. But remember the Jewish way, back up just a verse or two, right, to, the, to almost the beginning of the chapter. In verse two, here's what Isaiah said. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. So the Jews got this and they understood it. The imagery of light and the Messiah, they go hand in hand. And if you are a Jew, you know that. You don't need this to be pointed out to you. But if you're not a Jew, you need the dots to be connected. And so what John does is connect the dots for us. What was the very first act in creation? Think through that for a moment. Remember, John is alluding to creation in the beginning what was the very first word or words out of the mouth of the word? Who was God? What does he say? Let there be light. Do you see what John is doing here? He knows the audience and he understands where he's trying to take them. And you get to the end of the Bible, by the way, which I believe John wrote in the book of Revelation, and he says, and there will be no need for the sun, the, the S-U-N, why? Because Jesus will be the light of the world, the whole world, literally, right? So from the beginning all the way to the end and everywhere in between, Jesus is light. And he was there at creation and he will be there in eternity and he broke into our world to be the light that came into the darkness. And it's so awesome when, when you think through this and understand this, that not he has light, not that he gives light, he is light. He is the light of the world. And this is so incredibly important. Now let, let's go back and let's keep reading and, and let's see what John had to say in verse five. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Never, never, not when you get a bad diagnosis, never, not, not when your spouse walks away and says, I'm finished, never, not when the market crashes, never, the light cannot be extinguished by the darkness. And he says, God sent a man named John the Baptist to tell everyone about the, say it, Light, so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. Now he goes on to say, John himself was not the light. Let's say it like we know how to read. John himself was not the light, right? He was simply a witness to tell about the, the one who is the true, who gives to everyone was coming into the world. That's Christmas. That's the whole point of Christmas. In other words, the greatest thing that you and I can do as followers of this rabbi is to point people to the light, to Jesus, the, the one and only. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot extinguish it. They were living in darkness, but Jesus is the light, the light of the world. And the greatest thing, uh, the greatest light can overcome any and all darkness, but you have to believe. 
And you have to accept. It's not enough to know that the light came into the world. You have to receive and believe and accept the light. Now, how do you do that? Well, he tells us a couple of verses later in verse 12. But to all who believed him and to all who accepted him, he gave the right to become what? The children of God. God. He gets to be our heavenly father, and we get to refer to him as Abba, Daddy. It's a passionate, intimate thing that we become the children of God. And I wonder today if you're here this Christmas season, and that's not you yet. You know that the light came into the world, and and you see lights and understand light, but you've never received the light. And he's not your heavenly father. And he's not your uh, savior and the Lord of your life. Can, Can I just pause for a minute and give you a chance to take care of that? Because that's the gift of Christmas and you need to receive it. In fact, every head bowed, every eye closed. Could I, could I just lead you in a prayer helping you do just that? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. If you want to give your life to Christ, you just pray after me right where you're seated at all of our campuses. People are going to pray with you and for you. Nobody's going to pray alone, but you want to trust Jesus. Right where you're seated, would you just say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm in the dark. But in the best way that I know how, I turn my back on my sin, and I trust you alone, Jesus, to save me. Come be my Savior, my Lord, and my light. I receive you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray. And together we all say amen and amen. And if you just prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, welcome to to the family of God. And when we become the children of God, congratulations. When we become the children of God, listen, we're changed. And we're transformed and we are made different. And like I said earlier, Jesus declared that he is the light of the world. But in another place, in another gospel, Jesus not only said he's the light of the world, he said we are are the light of the world. That's Matthew 5, by the way. And and Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount. He's there by the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he's looking from a very low geography where where the sea is low, up the hill and up the mountain. And, and, And he says, you are the light of the world. And he says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Listen to me. He was pointing at a city. In fact, it's an ancient city that predates Jesus' life altogether. And every time I take a tour bus into Galilee, we always do it in the evening because I want the lights to be on and the lights to be lit up. And when you're coming on that highway at that high, high place, beginning to descend down into the region known as Galilee, you will see this massive ancient city on your left that's all lit up. And Jesus is saying a city on a hill can't hide. Why? Because it's on a hill. During the day, you can see it. But a city on a hill can't hide at night either because it's lit up. And Jesus is saying, you are the light of the world like a city on a hill. Nobody lights a candle and hides it under a bushel. Listen, and the light is shining out into the world. It's shining out to all those around. And so just like John the Baptist, we are reflecting the light that Jesus is. You say, what's your point? Uh, My point is we don't have any light. Just like John the Baptist, we're not the light. We just reflect the light, right? In the same way that the moon reflects the light of the sun. You know the moon has no light of its own. It simply reflects the light from the sun. And the only time of the year that the moon does not reflect the light of the sun is during a what? Eclipse. What's an eclipse? Eclipse is when the earth gets between the sun and the moon. The application is unbelievable. The only time the children of God who are not the light don't reflect the light of the son of God is when the earth gets between us and the sun. And we begin to worship the things of the earth. We begin to focus on the things of the earth. Our job as believers, hear me, is to reflect the son of God. God, to reflect the light. We always give him the glory. Let me just say something to you. If you follow people on social media and everything they post is about them, you be afraid. 
Because 99% of what we put out there for the world to see ought to be reflecting the light of God. It ought to be reflecting what Jesus has done, us giving him glory. Why? Because we don't have any light. We're simply reflecting the light. And so like John the Baptist, that's what we're doing. And we are shining out the light that Jesus puts on us and puts in us. And and so this next year, what are three different ways that we want to focus in on shining the light? The, The first one we just completed last weekend, TC Toys. Over 5,000 children received toys and gifts. 5,000 children. Over 1,500 volunteers. And the biggest news of all is we watched 178 men and women and boys and girls give their lives to Jesus Christ in one day. In one day. 54 of them followed the Lord in believers' baptism. Another 80-something made other decisions for, for the Lord. I could tell you story after story after story. I, I wish Rachel in my office, who runs the office of the pastor, uh, could come and tell you this story because she told me this story on, on Sunday night. And, and she said she was counseling this, this group of people, and, and, and this older man uh, had gave his life to Christ, and his daughter, grown daughter, was with him. And she also gave her life to Christ and they came down the aisle together and he's talking about what Jesus has done in his life and how grateful he is for his salvation. And he says, I'm going to be baptized. And his daughter says, I'm going to be baptized with you. And so the daughter, the grown woman says to Rachel, Hey, my daughter, nine-year-old daughter is in the party down in the children's party. Could you go get her? And so Rachel went down into the party and checked out the nine-year-old daughter and brought her back into the counseling room. And and the the mother looks at the daughter and says, hey, your granddad gave his life to Christ and is going to be baptized. I gave my life to Christ and I'm going to be baptized and you're going to be baptized. And she went, (laughs) she's terrified. She said, no, you're doing it. No questions asked. And so Rachel is is an attorney. She's an HR attorney. And so she kind of intervened and, you know, called for a timeout sidebar, pull us away from the judge and said, hey, it's really important that it be the individual decision that she gives her life to Christ. That's what baptism is, is a picture of her giving her life to Christ. It's not your decision. It's her decision. And so we need to back off a little bit and let it be her decision. Mom says, okay, I don't like it, but okay. And, and, and so the, the two get in line to be baptized and Rachel takes the nine-year-old daughter and stands beside the baptistry watching people be baptized. And, and during the baptism, she says, is the water warm? And Rachel said, yep, it's warm. And, and, and chair in there? Yep, chair in there. Uh, uh, it's not real deep. No, nope, it's not real deep. And, and the conversation is just continuing. And, and then she looks up at Rachel and she says, okay, I'll do it. And Rachel says, you'll do, you'll do what? And she says, I'll be baptized. She says, okay, it's very important that you understand what this is about. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just about getting in a pool. And she begins to communicate to this little girl. And a couple of sentences into it, she realizes, I'm an attorney And the words I use are HR words, which none of us understand. And and, and this child is not getting what I'm saying. She says, she's smart enough to know she makes up words like attorneys and doctors do. And so she said, the kid's not getting it. And and so she said, I need somebody else. About that time, Tommy, our lead elementary pastor, comes walking by and she's like, Tommy, come here. And so Tommy comes over and she said it was a sight to see. As Tommy got on his knees and looked this little girl in the eyes and got on her level, his voice changed and he began to explain the gospel. And this nine-year-old received Christ and gave her life to Jesus. And about that time, the girl granddad and the mom were about to descend into the baptistry and Rachel said, stop and, and put a pause on it and stop them. And, and, and then the little girl went around and got in the baptistry with the granddad and the mom and all three of them were baptized together. And three generations in one family gave their life to Christ. Look at this picture, which is uh, glorious. And church, what I want to say to you today is hear me. I know you're in a big church and I know you see this kind of stuff happen all the time, but you will rob your heart if what you think is 178 people and you just think a number. Listen, those numbers have names and those names have stories and every one of them matters to their heavenly father. They are people that Jesus died for and Jesus loves. I could tell you story after story after story. Uh, uh, One more, two more. (laughs) In the counseling room, after after I help the adults accept Christ and they make their way to the counseling room, I leave and follow behind and go into the counseling room and I talk to them. 
because I'm the one who shared the gospel. I want to go and talk to them about their next step. And, and, and I will talk to them about believer's baptism, that it's the next step of obedience. And they are 70% more likely to continue to take steps of walking with Jesus after they get baptized. 70% is a big time head start. So we said, hey, can anybody think of any good reason, not a lame one, but a good one, why you wouldn't want to do that today? And of course, there are never any good answers, right? But, but a few minutes later, 20 minutes later, I'm walking in the hallway and this lady walks up to me and she says, I think I have a good one. And I said, a good what? And she said, a good reason to not be baptized today. She said, I don't know actually if it is a good one. And I want to be baptized today. I want to follow the Lord. He, he, he just entered my life and my life is going to be different. I'm certain of it. And I want to be baptized, but I don't know if I should do it today. And I just want to ask you, Pastor, should I be baptized today? I said, what, what is your reason? And she said, I had a C-section a few days ago. And I said, yep, you win. <laughs> right? You, 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 you should wait, but I want to do it. I want to be baptized today. No, let's, let's wait a few days. And, and uh, I think you should wait. I don't, I'm not a doctor. She said, I thought you were. I said, it's different. <laughs> I, I can tell you the Hebrew for C-section, but I don't know how long we should wait to get in the water after a C-section. And, and, and just, she just wanted to chase after God and wanted to be baptized. Another lady approached me in the hall and, and she said, hey, pastor, I, I just want to talk to you. She said, I prayed today to give my life to Christ but I heard that this church offers all kinds of counseling and, and I need some intense counseling. And I said, what, what is your issue and what, what are you walking through? And she said, for the last seven years, I've been in a very, very abusive marriage and he has beat me and my children over and over and over within an inch of our life many, many times. And she said, we, we're, we were living in a shelter. We're living in a shelter. I said, what, what shelter are you living in? And she said, in the Dayspring Villa which you sponsor, by the way, and you support the Day Springs Villa with your giving. And she said, the ladies who volunteer at the Day Spring Villa go to this church. I'm not surprised by that because that's who you are. And they serve and they volunteer all the time. And they've been telling me about Jesus. They've been telling me about their church and they brought me to TC Toys. And today I gave my life to Christ and I believe he has entered my life and my life is gonna be different, but I'm pretty sure I need some pretty intense counseling. And you know I'm not a counselor any more than the lawyer is a children's you know, communicator. And, and, and so I looked up and there was John Wheeler. I said, John, come here. And, and he came over and I introduced him to this lady and, and just lives Scales falling off of eyes, the lights coming on. Uh, uh, one more, I told you two more, one more. <laughs> some of you who've not been in church a long time, been at this church in a long time, you don't know some of the history. The last 15 years, we've launched three Hispanic churches. We've birthed them, housed them, and launched them out to be their own church, three over the last 15 years. And uh, the last one we launched a few years ago, and uh, the pastor's name is Epolito, and we give them a room and rooms, and they would meet, and we house their children in our children's area, and we collected rent for the whole three or four or five years that they were here with us. But I told the business office, do not keep the rent. Put it in a separate account. And four or five years later, when they were able to launch out into their own church, we gave them one big fat check and said, here's all the rent you've paid for the last several years. Use this as a bigger down payment on your property. Now, the pastor at Polito, I saw him here at TC Toys. And he was running the counseling arm and room for all those who spoke Spanish so that we could divvy up the people. If you speak English, go this way. If you speak Spanish, go this way. And he said, pastor, would you please come into the counseling area for the Hispanic people? And would you talk to them about baptism? He said, it's very difficult for a, a Hispanic person with a Catholic background to get over the fact that they were baptized as a baby and that they may need to be baptized after they gave their life to Christ. Could you come talk to them and tell them your story? And I said, of course I will. And so I went in there to this sweet spirit in the sweet room. Now, over the course of the day, Epolito and I had several conversations. And he said, I just want to tell you something. Just a few weeks ago, we paid off our new building. Come on. And he said, and we're about to go to two services. He said, pastor, could I meet with you and talk to you? Because it's not enough to say to the Hispanic culture, Hey, you need to make room for somebody else. I've got to say what I heard you say lots and lots of times. 
common hour, servant hour. He said, could I have lunch with you and you teach me how to teach my church to come an hour and serve an hour so that we can grow this ministry. And, and I just want you to see this, this sweet man of God who is leading this growing church at 21st and Garnett, Ippolito and his wife. Just <laughs> glory to God. And every single one of these Hispanic speaking people that didn't speak English in that, I said, hey, don't come to our church. Unless you have the gift of tongues and understand what I say, do not come to our church. You go to this Hispanic-speaking church, and here's the pastor right here. Second way we want to shine the light out this next year is TUL. God gave me this vision in 1994. And in January of this year, during a week-long fast, he said, now is the time for you to implement this vision. 24 years later. And by the way, when you memorize Scripture... You have no idea what God will do with that. And by the way, rarely will he use it that day. Rarely will he use it that day. Who do you think you are that you get to take the scripture that you are processing and taking in that day and get to use it that day? No, 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 no. It may be 50 years later that you use that word that God put in your heart. You trust him. He's the author of salvation and you listen to what he is saying. And, and we launched this ministry called TUL and the whole vision of this is, is to put salvation in teenagers' lives who are a part of other youth groups, not just our glorious youth group and that they carry that vision and passion back to their church and set their church on fire with the vision and, and the passion that they have as young people. One, one story, I'll just tell you one story from TUL, the, the one we did at, at uh, Maybe Center. This pastor, uh, I met him right before the event. He's a little bit older man and he pastors a church in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And after I give the invitation, and kids are hundreds, but hundreds of kids are coming down to give their life to Christ, and they go back to a counseling room, I'm making my way from the lower level where the basketball court is up the aisle at the Maybe Center to my right. And while I'm going up the aisle, this pastor I met earlier, he reaches in and just bear hugs me, and he says, I want you to look at my aisle. Nobody in it. I said, wow. Chairs. He said, no, 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 no. I brought 19 students, and all 19 are in that counseling room giving their life to Jesus Christ, all of them. This man drove a bus himself as the senior pastor to an event in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and brought 19 kids from the Stillwater Public Schools, and all of them gave their life to Christ. And, and, and the goal of that whole thing, by the way, is not to hoard the light. You don't hoard the light. You give the light. You reflect the light. We want lights lit all over this city. Third area. T.C. Jordan and T.C. Egypt. I think I told you last week or week before that I just returned. For the first time, I went to T.C. Jordan to preach live. And I just want to say to you, I cannot put T.C. Jordan in between my ears and my brain. There's no compartment for it. It does not fit. I don't know what to do with it. That men and women and boys and girls who have lost everything for their foreseeable lifetime, have immense joy, have forgiven the people who have killed their families, have forgiven the people who have destroyed and bombed and, and leveled their homes, have forgiven people who have taken everything from them and are walking in the joy of the Lord with the light turned on, I just said, I can't preach. What would I say to these people? I don't know anything about walking with Jesus compared to these people. Let them preach, and I will sit on the front row and listen. I don't know what to do. They said, no, 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 you're going to preach. I said, I don't know how. Watching covered cultural Muslim women who are still covered, it's a part of their culture, who have trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, all covered singing love songs to, to Jesus. I don't know what to do with that. One of the ladies came up to me afterwards and said, Pastor, it's the only word she knows in English. She said she wanted a picture with me. And, and, and so I stood beside her, and I'm nervous. I don't know the culture altogether, right? I don't want you to put your arm around a muzzle. You can't do that, you know? And, and, and so I'm just nervous. So I'm just standing there for the picture like this, you know? And, and I'm a hugger. I usually just hug, you know? And, and I'm like, I can't do that. And so I'm just standing there beside her, and she's completely covered. And, and she looks at the picture after it's taken, and, and this is what she says. No, no, please, please. She's not happy with my smile. 
We had to take the picture again. We took it four times before she was pleased with my smile. In fact, the third time she looked at it, she said, no, not this. She, she's not happy, and it's true. I can't fake a smile. I'm a little Bell's palsy, actually, when I, when I try to fake a smile. One goes this way, and one goes this way. My daughter's all the time going, that smile is horrible. I can't fake it. I, when I smile, it's amazing. When, when I'm faking it, it's not good. And, and, and so she's not pleased with my smile, and she's covered up. We can't even see her teeth. And, and, and she wants my smile. And here's the whole point that was told to me afterwards. She wants what she is doing underneath that thing from ear to ear to be seen on the mouth of the pastor who represents Jesus Christ, the light of the world. I don't know what to do with all of this. I, I haven't told you, by the way, this is the uh, announcement, first announcement. T.C. Egypt was gifted and given 10 acres of land. 10 acres of land. And we drove a bus and we went and sang worship songs on this piece of property. It's a working farm. And the reason that land was gifted is because people like you and me sacrificially gave at a Christmas offering previously in order to purchase a piece of property that most of you will never visit in Egypt. And apart from being landowners in Egypt, they would never have been gifted and deeded that, that piece of land. And it's gifted to them to become a city of refuge. It is gifted to become a place for recovery where people can go and live and go and camp and, and, and uh, find Jesus. It's a, it's a place where, uh, where Coptic men and women, where the Coptic man is offered a job and a bribe in order to become Islam or, or Muslim, and, and the wife says, no, 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 I'm not going, and, and, and they said, we'll kill you, and she has to have a place to go live. It's a place for God to do something like that in, in the Middle East, and it's because of your sacrificial giving. And because of all of this, they asked me in February to come back and to teach a pastoral alliance group of 700 pastors from all over the Middle East and to teach them and to encourage them. And then in March, they want me to speak at the Global Leadership Summit in the Middle East for pastors all over the world. Why is that happening? It's because they're recognizing your gift and your sacrifice and, and, and your leadership and they're recognizing what we are doing in that part of the globe. And we have zoned in on these three targets for this next year for our light to shine. And there's darkness, immense darkness in these areas, but God has given us a clear vision and direction to carry the light of the world into those places. And some of you are sitting here on your campus today and in your chair thinking, how? And I'd say, I, I don't know. We'll follow the light. And as far as it shines is as far as we'll go. We're just following the light. We're not the light. And we follow the light. And if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know that I will ever go to the Middle East. A lot of you will never be able to get on a plane and fly 24 hours to spend 10 days in Jordan or 10 days in Egypt. I hope most of you will. That's my prayer, that many of you will. You have to go see it if you're physically able to do that. But not all of you We'll volunteer at a TUL student event night this next year. Although we need probably hundreds and maybe a thousand of you to do that. But all of us can be a part of what we're going to do today. And shining this light out, the, the, the most elemental or elementary way that we can do that is through this Christmas offering. It's the way we prepare for this new year. It's the way that we get generous. It's the way that we fund these things that God has put on our hearts. And when you give, hear me, church, you're not just giving to a Christmas offering. Don't, don't miss that fact. You're giving to life change through TC Toys. You, you, you're giving so that teenagers can come to know Christ and carry Christ back into their faith family. You're, you're, you're giving so we can reach more people in the Middle East and they will be lit on fire for Jesus, carrying the gospel out across 500 million people all over the Middle East. That's what this offering is all about. It's about shining the light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows after me will have light. Do you know what that means? Listen, that means to follow him is to have him. 
the light of the world. To follow him is to have him. And Jesus goes on to say, and you will have the light, the light of life. In, in verse 4, John chapter 1, he says, and in him was life, and the light was the life of men. In other words, until you have Jesus, you don't have light. What, what, what does the light of the world mean? What, what does that mean, light of the world? I've been pondering that question all week long. What, what does that mean, light of the world? Because it can't mean that all the darkness of the world is gone. Right? It can't mean that. We live here. We know that's not true. Oh, 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 there is darkness in, in this world. That can't be the answer. That the light has come so all the darkness is gone. That, that cannot be what that means. I, I, I think it means the world has no other light other than him. It's Jesus or darkness. There is no alternative. You know, you know what I think it means? I think it means that the world needs the light. Needs it because there is no other light. It, mean, it means that the world was created and made for the light. The one by whom and through whom and for whom it was created was created for him, for the light. And the light is in us and it is shining out and the eyes of our hearts need to be open. And when they are, we realize we have the light. We, we have it and we respond to it. And today at all of our churches, we're gonna respond in an act of gratitude and in an act of worship by bringing our Christmas offering to, to the Lord today. And we will bring from our treasure and our heart a gift to God. And, and so at every campus, I want you to stand as I pray over you. At every campus, would you just stand across the auditorium? And I just wanna pray over you today. And as I do, I, I, I just want you to take that offering, if you have it, Maybe you need to get ready or get prepared. But if you have it ready, just, just hold it in your hands. And, and just hold it before the Lord. And my challenge to you last week was for you to pray and ask God what he would have you to give. And how he would enable your sacrifice and how he would take care of it. And I, I pray that you did. I pray that you did that discipleship assignment. But, but as you just hold it before the Lord, would you just hold it out before him? And I just want to pray over you at every campus today. Lord, today I pray over your kids. And, and I pray, Lord, today that as we give to you from our treasure, that, Lord, the only reason we have this in our hands is because you placed it there. And now we're trusting you with it and we, we, we want to put it back into your kingdom. So would you take it and use it and bless it and multiply it? Would you, would you uh, make yourself known through it? And Father, I pray that you would grow our church, not just in breadth, but in depth. That you would take us deeper in our worship, that you would take us deeper in our love for you, that you would take us further as evangelists and those who are doing the work of an evangelist taking seriously the men and women and boys and girls all around us who need the light. Grow us in our passion. Grow us in our generosity. May we look like you because we are so generous. And so, Father, grow us today and receive our gifts. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we all say amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Remember to click subscribe and turn on your notifications if you haven't already so that you don't miss a single thing. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Instagram and at our website, thechurch.at. Again, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.